Welcome to Living Word. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was with God in the beginning. Through Him all things were made. Without Him nothing was made that has been made. In Him was life, and that life was the light of all mankind. The Word became flesh and made His dwelling among us. We have seen His glory, the glory of the one and only Son, who came from the Father, full of grace and truth. Well, hello again. I'm Pastor Kathleen Casper, and this is Living Word. Living Word is a teaching program which seeks to bring us closer to God as we study His Word. His Word is a living Word. The Holy Spirit enlivens it, touches our hearts, where God would have our hearts and our minds and our lives be touched, and He draws us into that embrace of His. He is our loving, loving, living God. And so we are in the letter of Paul that he wrote to the Romans. And uh, let's begin now with a word of prayer. Good and loving Heavenly Father, thank you for the day that you have given to us. It is indeed a beautiful day that you have made. We ask, Heavenly Father, now as we are continuing and even completing today our study of Paul's letter to the Romans, we pray, Lord, that you would continue to touch our hearts, our minds, our lives, our spirits through it. We thank you, O oh Lord, for this letter, and we are so appreciative of the fact that it is in um, the canon of the Bible. So we ask now for you to touch my tongue and to touch our ears, for me to be able to, to declare your praise and for us to be able to hear it and receive it in Jesus' name. Amen. Yesterday we heard Paul instruct believers how to live and function in the world that remains largely hostile to God. Being in the world, but not of the world, how do we live under secular governments? And when I use the word secular, I am speaking of governments which follow the ways of the world rather than God's ways. Paul, writing to Roman citizens who are living during the time of Emperor Nero, would have been speaking to people who are living in less than hospitable conditions. Paul offers no references to Nero in this letter, nor does he offer an opinion about this particular emperor. What he does do is he lays down positive principles by which we believers in Christ ought to live regardless of where we live. Paul begins by writing, everyone must submit himself to the governing authorities, for there is no authority except that which God has established. The authorities that exist have been established by God. And our flesh immediately responds, even Hitler, Stalin, Lenin, even Saddam Hussein, even Kim Jong-il. The list of despicable leaders goes on and on and on. Paul was writing to people under a despicable ruler, and these were his words to them. These are Paul's words by inspiration of the Holy Spirit, so they are God's word to all believers. Should we toy with plans to rebel against the authorities over us, then we are rebelling against what God has instituted, and judgment then awaits us. There probably have been many times in history when believers in Christ have worked for the removal of an evil ruler, but the story of Germany's Dietrich Bonhoeffer is fairly well known. Dietrich Bonhoeffer was a German Lutheran pastor and theologian during the murderous regime of Adolf Hitler. And he was a participant in the German resistance movement against Nazism. He was involved in plans to assassinate Adolf Hitler. Bonhoeffer said, I cannot escape guilt by evading my responsibility. He finally concluded it is better to do evil than to be evil. The plan to assassinate Adolf Hitler was discovered and Bonhoeffer and some of the other co-conspirators were arrested. And then in 1945, just 23 days before the Nazis surrendered, Dietrich Bonhoeffer was hung. Bonhoeffer did not see himself as above the law in Germany. He never attempted to justify his action. In fact, Bonhoeffer told friends that he considered that his participation in the conspiracy had made him unfit for the pulpit should he survive the war. Did Bonhoeffer know? and understand what Paul had written in Romans 13? Sure, he most certainly did. 
He counted what it might cost him to be involved in the conspiracy, and he determined that for him, he needed to do whatever he could to remove Hitler from power, even if it cost him his life. Romans 13, it is a general statement to all believers. Believers in Christ Jesus are to be law-abiding citizens wherever we live. Paul wrote, give everyone what you owe him. If you owe taxes, pay taxes. If revenue, then revenue. If respect, then respect. If honor, then honor. Yesterday we returned to the story of Daniel, a young exile from Jerusalem in Babylon. Daniel lived an exemplary life in Babylon, and he received great promotion within Nebuchadnezzar's administration. God may have plans to promote us within the world system in order that we might represent his kingdom as Daniel did. We must remember that as believers in Christ Jesus, we are the salt of the earth and the light of the world. God has us where we are so that we can be his agents of change in the earth. Romans 14. In Romans 14, Paul turns his attention to how the strong in faith are to treat the weak in faith and vice versa in matters that could easily divide believers. Much of what divides Christians has no bearing whatsoever on anyone's salvation. In one of the congregations that I know of, many years ago, the entire congregation nearly split over the decision of whether the women should purchase 9-inch or 7-inch dinner plates. I just shake my head at some of the ridiculous things people get upset about. Let's stop making mountains out of molehills and get to work doing what our Lord has commanded of us. Because there apparently were some difficulties in Rome concerning what could be eaten or not eaten, or about whether one day was more important than another, Paul admonishes both the strong and the weak. And he writes, Accept him whose faith is weak without passing judgment on disputable matters. One man's faith allows him to eat everything, but another man whose faith is weak eats only vegetables. The man who eats everything must not look down on him who does not, and the man who does not eat everything must not condemn the man who does. For God has accepted him. Who are you to judge someone else's servant? To his own master he stands or falls, and he will stand, for the Lord is able to make him stand. What is behind this particular dispute? In Rome, as in many other pagan-influenced parts of the world, the meat people could buy in the marketplace most likely would have been the excess portions of the meat removed from animals which had been sacrificed to idols. The strong in faith would have thought nothing of eating such meat because they knew idols were nothing. The weak in faith, however, wouldn't eat the meat because they didn't want to be connected in any way to idol worship. Paul tells both the strong and the weak not to judge each other, but he will ultimately tell the strong not to put stumbling blocks in front of the weak. Verse 5. One man considers one day more sacred than another. Another man considers every day alike. Each one should be fully convinced in his own mind. He who regards one day as special does so to the Lord. He who eats meat eats to the Lord, for he gives thanks to God. And he who abstains does so to the Lord and gives thanks to God. For none of us lives to himself alone, and none of us dies to himself alone. If we live, we live to the Lord, and if we die, we die to the Lord. So whether we live or die, we belong to the Lord. None of us lives for ourselves, or no, and none of us lives to ourselves. We have got to remember this. We belong to the body of Christ if we believe in Jesus. So as members of Christ's body, we belong to one another, and we are all under our Lord Jesus, who is the head of the body and the head of the church. We've got to stop thinking of what divides us and begin to focus on the Lord. When we keep our hearts focused on Him, the things we tend to argue about will become as nothing to us, because most of the things that we argue about are nothing anyway. So, the things we argue about generally are nothing. So, let's not argue about them. We aren't living for what we eat or for any particular day. We are living for the Lord and no one and nothing else. So we're living for the Lord, no one else, 
Nothing else. Verse 9, Paul says, For this reason Christ died and returned to life, so that he might be the Lord of both the dead and the living. You then, why do you judge your brother? Or why do you look down on your brother? For we will all stand before God's judgment seat. It is written, As surely as I live, says the Lord, every knee will bow before me. Every tongue will confess to God. So then each of us will give an account of himself to God. Therefore, let us stop passing judgment on one another. Instead, make up your mind not to put any stumbling block or obstacle in your brother's way. As one who is in the Lord, I am fully convinced that no food is unclean in itself. But if anyone regards something as unclean, then for him it is unclean. If your brother is distressed because of what you eat, you are no longer acting in love. Do not by your eating destroy your brother for whom Christ died. Do not allow what you consider good to be spoken of as evil. For the kingdom of God is not a matter of eating and drinking, but of righteousness, peace, and joy in the Holy Spirit. Because anyone who serves Christ in this way is pleasing to God and approved by men. Let us therefore make every effort to do what leads to peace and to mutual edification. That word edification means mutual building up of one another in the faith. Paul says, do not destroy the work of God for the sake of food. All food is clean, but it is wrong for a man to eat anything that causes someone else to stumble. It is better not to eat meat or drink wine or to do anything else that will cause your brother to fall. So whatever you believe about these things, keep between yourself and God. Blessed is the man who does not condemn himself by what he approves. But the man who has doubts is condemned if he eats because his eating is not from faith. And everything that is not done from faith is sin. In the final analysis, it is love, love that must rule our hearts, not judgmentalism. Romans 15, Paul continues to address the strong in faith. He says, we who are strong ought to bear with the failings of the weak and not to please ourselves. Each of us should please his neighbor for his good to build him up. In other words, all that we do ought to be done by letting the Lord rule our hearts. Not doing things for ourselves, but by allowing the Lord to rule our hearts. Verse 3, Paul says, For even Christ did not please himself, but, as it is written, the insults of those who insult you have fallen on me. For everything that was written in the past was written to teach us, so that through endurance and encouragement of the scriptures, we might have hope. With verse 5 of chapter 15, Paul begins to conclude his letter. He begins with a blessing that God would give the Roman Christians, the Roman believers, unity. Paul writes, May the God who gives endurance and encouragement give you a spirit of unity among yourselves as you follow Christ, so that with one heart and mouth you may glorify the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. Accept one another then just as Christ accepted you in order to bring praise to God. For I tell you that Christ has become a servant of the Jews on behalf of God's truth to confirm the promises made to the patriarchs so that the Gentiles may glorify God for his mercy. The acknowledgement here is that which we've heard before. The gospel of Jesus Christ is for Jews and Gentiles alike. It's for everyone in the entire world. The human ancestry of Jesus came through the Jews, and the Jews received much in advance from the Lord as God unfolded his plan to reconcile the world to himself. However, all along, the plans of God included Gentiles to be saved with the Jews. Paul now adds a number of passages from the Old Testament, specifically from 2 Samuel, the Psalms, Deuteronomy, and Isaiah, which point to the inclusion of the Gentiles with the Jews in God's plans and purposes. He says, as it is written, Therefore, 
I will praise you among the Gentiles. I will sing hymns to your name. Again, it says, rejoice, O Gentiles, with his people. And again, praise the Lord, all you Gentiles, and sing praises to him, all you peoples. And again, Isaiah says, the root of Jesse will spring up, one who will arise to rule over the nations. The Gentiles will hope in him. May the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace as you trust in him, so that you may overflow with hope by the power of the Holy Spirit. I myself, says Paul, am convinced, my brothers, that you yourselves are full of goodness, complete in knowledge and competent to instruct one another. I have written you quite boldly on some points, as if to remind you of them again, because of the grace God gave me. Now, we can agree with Paul. Paul most definitely was bold as he wrote of the godlessness and wickedness of men throughout the world and how God gave men over to the sinful desires of their hearts and to the lusts of their flesh. Paul boldly wrote that believers in Christ aren't to keep on sinning so that God's grace could abound. He clearly stated that we died to sin. How then could we continue to live in it? Paul has written with boldness but he has also been wonderfully encouraging. Verse 15, Paul says, I have written you quite boldly on some points, as if to remind you of them again, because of the grace God gave me to be a minister of Christ Jesus to the Gentiles with the priestly duty of proclaiming the gospel of God so that the Gentiles might become an offering acceptable to God, sanctified by the Holy Spirit. How would the Gentiles become an offering acceptable to God the same way as the Jews would become acceptable to God. The gospel Paul proclaimed was that God through Jesus has made a righteousness available to all that is apart from law. This righteousness comes by faith in Jesus, the one who sanctifies us or the one who consecrates us or the one who sets us apart, both Jew and Gentile, to become an offering acceptable to God is the Holy Spirit. God is actively engaged in our lives in every life throughout the world. We who were born in sin and darkness are saved and cleansed and set apart for God because God came searching for us. We would never have come to know God or his love for us had he not come looking for us. But thanks be to God, he did come looking for us. We couldn't save ourselves, and so he did that for us. We couldn't find him, so he found us. Our God is an awesome God. Paul adds, beginning at verse 17, Therefore I glory in Christ Jesus in my service to God. I will not venture to speak of anything except what Christ has accomplished through me in leading the Gentiles to obey God by what I have said and done, by the power of signs and miracles, through the power of the Spirit. So from Jerusalem all the way to Illyricum, I have fully proclaimed the gospel of Christ. The gospel of Jesus Christ from its beginnings in the first century was to be both in word and in powerful deed, just as Jesus proclaimed it. Signs and wonders are part of the proclamation of Jesus Christ. They point to him. They let the world that is still so very much in the kingdom of darkness know that light has come into the world and that power is readily available to free all who remain in captivity to the devil. Verse 20, Paul says, It has always been my ambition to preach the gospel where Christ was not known so that I would not be building on someone else's foundation. Now, there would not have been anything wrong with Paul building on someone else's foundation. But in these early years of spreading the gospel of Jesus Christ, they were spreading the gospel of Jesus Christ with great urgency. And so they were wanting to proclaim that gospel wherever it had not been proclaimed so that more people could hear the good news of Christ and then know what God had done for them. He goes on to say, Rather, as it is written, those who were not told about him will see, and those who have not heard will understand. This is why I have often been hindered from coming to you. Paul says here, I wanted to come to you very a lot of times, many times, long before now, but he was always hindered from coming to them. 
But he says now that there is no more place for me to work in these regions, and since I have been longing for many years to see you, I plan to do so when I go to Spain. I hope to visit you while passing through and to have you assist me on my journey there after I've enjoyed your company for a while. Now, however, I am on my way to Jerusalem in the service of the saints there. For Macedonia and Achaia were pleased to make a contribution for the poor among the saints in Jerusalem. They were pleased to do it, and indeed they owe it to them. For if the Gentiles have shared in the Jews' spiritual blessings, they owe it to the Jews to share with them their material blessings. So after I have completed this task and have made sure that they have received this fruit, I will go to Spain and visit you on the way. I know that when I come to you, I will come in the full measure of the blessing of Christ. I urge you, brothers, by our Lord Jesus Christ and by the love of the Spirit to join me in my struggle by praying to God for me. Pray that I may be rescued from the unbelievers in Judea and that my service in Jerusalem may be acceptable to the saints there so that by God's will I may come to you with joy and together with you be refreshed. The God of peace be with you. Amen. Opposition was an unfortunate fact that Paul faced in many of the places that he went. Opposition to the gospel will always be a possibility wherever it is proclaimed. Jesus said so. If we remember John 15, Jesus said to his disciples, If the world hates you, keep in mind that it hated me first. If you belong to the world, it would love you as its own. As it is, you do not belong to the world, but I have chosen you out of the world. That is why the world hates you. Remember the words I spoke to you. No servant is greater than his master. If they persecuted me, they will persecute you also. If they obeyed my teaching, they will obey yours also. They will treat you this way because of my name, for they do not know the one who sent me. Paul now concludes his letter with commendations and greetings and admonishments. Though Paul had never been to Rome, we're going to notice as we read through Romans 16 that he knew quite a few people who lived there. And so he sends them his personal greetings. Romans 16. I commend to you our sister Phoebe, a servant of the church in Sincrea. I ask you to receive her in the Lord in a way worthy of the saints and to give her any help that she may need from you. For she has been a great help to many people including me. Greet Priscilla and Aquila, my fellow workers in Christ Jesus. They risked their lives for me. Not only I, but all the churches of the Gentiles are grateful to them. Greet also the church that meets in their house. Greet my dear friend Epinatus, who was the first convert to Christ in the province of Asia. Greet Mary, who worked very hard for you. Greet Andronicus and Junia, my relatives, who have been in prison with me. They are outstanding among the apostles, and they were in Christ before I was. Greet Ampliatus, whom I love in the Lord. Greet Urbanus, our fellow worker in Christ, and my dear friend Stachus. Greet Applius, tested and approved in Christ. Greet those who belong in the house of Aristobulus. Greet Herodian, my relative. Greet those in the household of Narcissus, who are in the Lord. Greet Trephina and Trephosa, those women who work hard in the Lord. Greet my dear friend Persis, another woman who has worked very hard in the Lord. Greet Rufus, chosen in the Lord, and his mother, who has been a mother to me too. Greet Asyncritus, Phlegon, Hermes, Patrobus. Hermas, and the brothers with them. Greet Philologus, Julia, Nereus, and his sister, and Olympus, and all the saints with them. Greet one another with a holy kiss. All the churches of Christ send greetings. I urge you, brothers, to watch out for those who cause divisions and put obstacles in your way that are contrary to the teaching you have heard. Keep away from them, for such people are not serving our Lord Christ, but their own appetites. By the smooth talk and flattery, they deceive the minds of na naive people. 
Everyone has heard about your obedience, so I am full of joy over you. But I want you to be wise about what is good and innocent about what is evil. The God of peace will soon crush Satan under your feet. The grace of our Lord Jesus be with you. Timothy, my fellow worker, sends his greetings to you, as do Lucius, Jason, and Sosipater, my relatives. I, Tertius, who wrote down this letter, greet you in the Lord. Gaius, whose hospitality I and the whole church here enjoy, sends you his greetings. Erastus, who is the city's director of public works, and our brother Quartus, send you their greetings. Now to him, who is able to establish you in my gospel and the proclamation of Jesus Christ according to the revelation of the mystery hidden for long ages past, but now revealed and made known through the prophetic writings by the command of the eternal God, so that all nations might believe and obey him. To the only wise God be glory forever through Jesus Christ. Amen. The mystery Paul speaks of here, the mystery hidden for long ages past, was that God would be the one to reconcile the world to himself through his own Son. That God was going to make available to everyone righteousness that is not by works of the law, but by faith in Jesus. The law and the prophets bore witness to what God was going to do, but understanding such an amazing thing as what God was planning had to wait until God acted in time and in history. The one to whom Paul proclaimed is the one true God, and through his son Jesus, he would draw all people to himself. We are now at the conclusion of Paul's letter to the Romans. It has been a wow word. This is the good news that we have to share throughout the world. Paul shared it wherever he went. It's our turn to share it wherever we go. It is given to us by inspiration of the Holy Spirit. It is good news. It is what God has done for us through Jesus Christ. It shows us how to live the Christian life. Thanks be to God for this wonderful, wonderful word. Let me now bless you. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord look upon you with his favor and grant you his peace. Bye-bye. Until next time. Thank you for joining Pastor Kathleen. Through this message, we hope that you will have come to know God better. God can be known and wants to be known by each person on earth. God is a communicator. He has given us the Bible, his son Jesus, and the Holy Spirit as means through which he reveals himself and his will to us. God is love. And regardless of what is going on in your life, God loves you and is concerned for you. He is as near as a prayer and he can be trusted to be faithful to you. Living Word is a listener-supported program. Your prayers and donations are needed to keep this program on the air. Donations can be through the Living Word website or sent to Living Word, P.O. Box 3810, Alice, Texas, 78333-3810. If you have a question you'd like to ask Pastor Kathleen, a comment you'd like to share, or would like to purchase a CD of this message, and have access to the Internet, Pastor Kathleen's website is www.livingwordradio.org If you are in the area and would like to join Pastor Kathleen and the congregation she serves on the weekend, she is pastor of Emmanuel Lutheran Church in Alice, Texas.